You're listening to Opera Innovations, a podcast brought to you by ABA Technologies. This month on Thought Leaders, we'll be talking with Dr. Henry Rohn about how a few strokes of luck brought him to the field of behavior analysis and led him to his very successful career in dissemination and clinical and practical work. We are here with Dr. Henry Rohn. He is a professor of pediatrics and the division chief of the Center for Behavior Development and Genetics at Upstate Medical University. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Rohn. Yeah, thanks. And we've heard from a few others of our thought leaders on the podcast so far. And you are in my eyes, and these are my you know, subjective eyes picking out the podcast topics, um, one of those. So we, I am interested in hearing how you got into the field and with your very diverse education, and I know that you were even at, you know, Johns Hopkins, Mm -hmm. um, how you got into the field, and then how you got even more into your clinical and research applications as well. Um, Yeah, sure. It's all, um, you know, it's all one big story of uh, either dumb luck or just having to be in the right place at the right time, but um, the... um, when i was a kid my dad um ran a nursing home and um i spent a lot of time there um that was sort of when i got punished i had to you know do stuff at the nursing home and so um i spent a lot of time around um the elderly and um and then when i went to to school to college i um was had planned to um work in the area of um memory loss with the elderly and i was actually working with a developmental psychologist at lsu named katie cherry who um, was a mentor to me and we were doing research on uh memory dysfunction and folks with um, alzheimer's versus um, folks of typical cognitive development and so while i was doing all that i knew kind of pretty early on in undergrad that i needed to get some research experience and get good letters to get into graduate school and stuff like that. But I went to LSU and I was uh, also um, full blown fraternity guy, frankly, at that point. And uh, so I was a psychology major and I needed to take an elective psychology course. And being um, at that stage of my life, I attempted to take the latest starting classes as possible to get credits. And so one semester I go to register for classes and there's this um, 10.30 Tuesday, Thursday class on psychology of learning. I had no idea what it was. I was pretty sure I wanted to go study memory and stuff like that. And uh, this class started at 10.30 and that was about my, as early as I was willing to get up to take a class. And so I um, signed up for it. And it turned out the class was start, was uh, taught by this, new hire first year assistant professor at lsu named tim vollmer and i didn't know who he was obviously didn't know what he would become and uh so i took the class and i really liked um tim's teaching style uh you know it just made a lot of sense to me and the content was very um you know behavior analysis is kind of has this sort of uh, building block you know where you you learn about um, classical conditioning that builds on um, the early operant conditioning stuff and that builds on to sort of heavier content and so um, that that was real appealing to me and um, and I you know I enjoyed it but I still kind of had my sights set on doing the memory stuff and then um, one day Tim showed a video of uh, of the Cybus system the uh, self injurious behavior inhibiting system that that Brian Awada developed with others. And um, it says it's this video, if you've ever seen it, of these people just engaging in like really, really bad self-injury. And um, and then they don't when they put this device on. And, um, and so um, when my dad ran a nursing home, one of the patients in, in the nursing home was actually my aunt, who um, had really profound disabilities. And um, you know, when I was a kid, my mom would always make us go by her room. and She spent her life um, strapped to the bed, basically, and had nothing to really engage with but a, um, a, 
uh, baby mobile, you know, hanging over the bed. And she was nonverbal. She had bitten off large parts of her lips. She um, would hit herself. And so I see this video of Tim and I'm like, oh my God, that's my Aunt Susan. And, the, you know, I mean, not you know, well, literally my Aunt Susan, but it was uh, that same kind of thing. And I, I think it might have been like the end of that class where I walked up to Tim and um, asked if I could volunteer to be in his lab. And um, I had, you know, I just had no idea that treatment of self-injury existed, no idea that functional analysis was a thing, um, no idea who Tim was. And, um, and I guess I had done well enough in the class because he accepted me. And then um, I just kind of got into it and we started working in schools and, um, and it sort of took off from there. So what after that? So you, you got your MA, your BS and your MA at LSU. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, um, I finished up my PhD there. And so about, um, so I was, um, I'm still real close with a, a fellow grad student of mine, Joel Ringdahl, and um, Joel and I were there, and um, yeah, we had a real good group of, of people, um, and about halfway through my grad school, Tim left to go to uh, the University of Pennsylvania, um, and I had a, about a year where I didn't have a major professor in graduate school, so I, there's this clinical psychologist who does work in intellectual disabilities named Johnny Madsen, and he sort of took me under his wing, um, as well as a school psychologist named George Knoll. And so they, they kind of um, shepherded me through, and I had the opportunity to go up to join Tim at University of Pennsylvania to do my, um, my pre-doctoral internship. And um, I was getting ready, you know, I was all planning to, to move to Philadelphia, and then um, LSU was doing a job search for an assistant professor and they hired Dorothy Lerman, um, who had been at Hopkins at the time. And so, you know, I thought, well, this is a chance to sort of um, be with a professor when they're getting started on the ground level of like a research center and a, um, setting up a research agenda, contracts with schools, all this other stuff. And I guess I just sort of realized that that would be a really good experience and it would probably be helpful to Dorothy too. And so I stuck around LSU for a year to work with Dorothy. Um, and she brought in Carol Van Camp and Mike Kelly as first year grad students. So we had a really good team right off the bat. Um, and then Dorothy had connections at Johns Hopkins. And so, you know, then I thought, I, I knew enough by then that it, it was sort of all about graduate school was all about kind of um, conquering one obstacle and moving to the next one, you know, so doing your thesis and then trying real hard to get your thesis published and then making sure that gets turned into a talk. So people start to recognize your name. And so doing all these things. And so I knew enough that um, it would be good to have contacts at both University of Pennsylvania and Johns Hopkins. And so, um, Sure enough, when, you know, when the time came, I had to make a choice and I chose um, to work at Hopkins. And um, I was just real fortunate that Kathleen Piazza needed a, um, somebody to be a research, um, kind of a research assistant. And so I ended up, um, they were able to work out a, a deal for me to go to, um, to Hopkins and work on the NBU. Um, but in a little bit more of like a supervisor capacity uh, managing Kathleen's severe behavior cases. And so that was awesome because she was doing a lot of stuff in automatic reinforcement at the time and it dovetailed into my dissertation and um, she was interested in some behavioral economics and um, we were doing a bunch of stuff with PICA and so that was just a really cool opportunity to work with somebody who, and I think she may have been an AE for Java at the time, but um, you know, it was great. And it turned out for the best. Tim ended up going to Florida. And so, um, so the Seashore House program kind of floundered a little bit anyway. But, um, but anyway, so I ended up at Hopkins. Um, and that's, um, that was, you know, honestly, like career and life altering in a lot of different ways. But um, that's just a super, just, it's like indescribable how amazing that environment was. Um, it, you know, it is now still, but there's just so many smart people um, 
and that one facility working on these really, really complex cases and doing a great job of it. And um, you learn so much. Um, and while I was there working with Kathleen, um, her husband, Wayne Fisher, was running the neurobehavioral unit. And um, I was very intimidated by Wayne because he was just this major guy in the field, you know, and um, had, he was the first person I'd ever met to, who had NIH funding. And, um, yeah, so it was like this real big deal. And um, so Kathleen one day said to me, like, hey, you know, Wayne's going to start going down to Atlanta um, to set up a program down there. They, you know, they want him to consult or whatever she said. And, you know, we know you're from the South. Maybe you would like, you know, I, I kind of mentioned to Wayne, uh, you know, that maybe maybe he'd like to take you down there with him. And that was weird because Wayne had his own trainee at the time. And, you know, it felt like I was like jumping kind of in front of the other person, but, you know, it is what it is. And so, um, so I ended up going down with, to the Marcus, uh, or the, they had a little program at the time called the Marcus Center. And um, it was just this little program and the guy, Bernie Marcus, had given just some insane amount of money to Johns Hopkins to set up a replication site down in, in Atlanta. And um, so Wayne and I started going. And so I'm just like, you know, a year before I was just like Dorothy Lerman's research assistant, which isn't a bad gig that, you know, it's a good gig, but, and suddenly I'm like flying down every other week with Wayne, hanging out in restaurants with him, you know, spending just like a lot of time with this really, really smart dude. And, you know, we're basically just flying to Atlanta, consulting on patients, um, kind of proving, I think, to the, to the leadership of that program, sort of what could be done um, through behavior analysis. They were doing mostly developmental pediatrics at the time. And so, um, and so that got me working, obviously, very closely with Wayne. And then um, the decision was made to, to grow that program and to build out um, a unit that would serve this, these populations like we were working with in Baltimore, both for feeding and, and severe behavior people. And, um, and so um, I got a job offer to um, either stay in Baltimore or, um, and work on MBU or to move to Atlanta and help start up this new program. And, um, you know, the, being at the being at Hopkins and being at the MBU is extremely prestigious and a great opportunity. But um, you know, you just don't get many chances in life to start something from scratch and build it. And um, and it was a little closer to home and whatnot. So there were some personal reasons. But um, you know, just being able to be somewhere and seeing what goes into program development in terms of just where the money comes from, how it works, how the financial models of a um, major institution work, recruitment of staff, getting a research agenda started. You know, it's, um, it's all a giant pain in the butt, but it's also just like this, this crash course in program development. And, and we did it all, um, you know, over about three years. And, um, ended up, you know, working with architects to build out this 80 something thousand square foot building that they have and met with folks from Florida Tech when they wanted to build the Scott Center and they wanted to look at the Marcus program. And, um, and so that was really cool because we just, you know, we had to, we took a lot of what we had at Kennedy, but we had to um, work with local universities to start our own master's program, just all these things that you have to do. And so um, over the, you know, seven or eight years I was there, I learned how to do just all these different things. And then, um, you know, after a while, Wayne got recruited to go take over or just build out a program up in Omaha at Monroe Meyer. And um, I took over his job in Atlanta and was able to, Mike Kelly was there at the time working with me and we were able to recruit Nate Call to come from um, he had been a professor at LSU and we were able to get him to come back. And then um, Wayne made me a good offer to go out to Nebraska and help him start up a severe behavior unit. And um, I did. I'm still not sure what the, um, what my rationale was at the time. 
Um, it, you know, but it was again a chance to sort of work in a, you know, get another chance at program development. And, um, and so I did it and it was, it was cool. It was great. Um, and then we were out in Nebraska and, um, my wife had twins. We had twins. Um, she did all the work, but we, um, they were in the NICU and she said, you know, we need to move close to home and, um, home for her is, um, is beautiful gray Syracuse, New York. And so, uh, so I moved to, um, I came out and gave a grand rounds at our med school out here. And, um, the dude, that was running the department in our children's hospital at the time as a nephrologist by training. But for whatever reason, he was completely um, just blown away by this, not necessarily by me, I don't think that was it, but just having a psychologist come in and talk about behavior analysis and talk about, show before and after videos of how we treat these kids. And so I put together a business plan for them um, and they hired me to start a clinic out here. and. I've been fortunate to draw on all of these other experiences I've had about um, program development to to start up a program um, here in Syracuse, and so it's been um, been really cool. It's taken ten years to kind of get it up and going, but we just got our first major philanthropic gift um, that'll sustain the program for many years, and um, and so it's been a um, it's not always been easy. It's been a lot of days where it feels like you're pushing the boulder up the mountain and it rolls down overnight. But um, yeah, it's been it's been fun and uh, a long way to get here. Well, and I mean, I think it's just amazing to hear you talk about it. And I know we mentioned before we started talking that you're not always big on talking about yourself. And so just listening to you talk about your experiences and how humble you are about them. And you're like, yeah, and then I was at Johns Hopkins, and then, yeah, I was at the Marcus Center, and then, yeah, I was at University of Nebraska Medical Center. If anybody in our field hears any of these names now, I mean, those, I mean, those are big centers. I, I mean, we've talked to, just on this podcast alone, we've talked to Georgia State University, which yeah. is also in the heart of Atlanta. Um, I've talked to Dr. Stephanie Kincaid. She's down at Rollins College right now in Florida. But I mean, she's been at the Marcus Center and just how impactful a lot of your work and your experiences have been, not just on, you know, the field, but also on, you know, creating all of these behavior analysts as well. Yeah. It's nice, too, because all those places built a statue out front. It's really cool. <laughs> they have. Um, yeah. It's funny to say that because I gave a, um, I was presenting in a, uh, at this conference in Sweden last week. And um, when the discussant got up to review my talk, he called me cocky. Um, and so it's funny that you just said I was, uh, I was, uh, I forget what term you use. Humble. Um, yeah. You sound humble today. Well, it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's weird when you talk about it because it's, there's a sense of detachment from it. And I still think I'm, you know, I'm Hank and I grew up in the, the small town in Louisiana and I don't, you know, I certainly don't think I'm like the smartest behavior analyst in the world. And I think I'm good at creating programs, but I've also been surrounded by really, really smart people who've taught me things. And I have, um, you know, like I have people like Mike Cataldo to call on as a mentor. and He runs this just, I don't know, $80 million program at Johns Hopkins. And I can, you know, if I ever run into issues, I can call Mike and say, look, man, I, you know, I need some advice or my, um, the guy who ended up hiring me here in, um, in pediatrics, um, you know, he's a really well-known dude in his field. And, um, the guy, um, you know, the close to the president of our university. And so, you know, having mentors like that, um, and knowing sort of when to ask for help, um, makes you seem smart but when you're in the when you're in the midst of it it's just a matter of kind of like well this is just sort of the next link in the in the chain you know or the next step and it's just the next thing I'm doing and um and so to kind of look back on it I mean I guess when I was just explaining all that I thought like oh yeah yeah Tim Vollmer Dorothy Lerman you know Johnny Matson that, that sounds cool and um 
Yeah, but I guess that's a Wayne Fisher. Just yeah, but keep the but names when coming. <laughs> but when you're doing it, it it doesn't seem like that. It seem you know it's just a matter of like I'm trying to get a job. Right. <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to get like my little data set published so I can go to ABBA this year. Not like it's it's not anything that's like um, you know it's really thought out at the time. I mean, obviously there was some strategy involved with like going to Kennedy over Penn and going to Marcus over staying at Kennedy and stuff like that. But um, none of that was from the perspective of, of setting out to say like, I want to be, a, you know, I used to actually joke with people that I wanted to reach a stage in my career where I could like look at a map and just say like, I want to move there and then have like the, you know, cloud or whatever it is to, um, to think that I would just be able to be like, all right, well, I'm going to show up in, uh, you know, Boise and suddenly like, you know, people will give me a job. And obviously that's, um, I said that when I was younger and stupider, but, um, but you know, like I was able to draw some of those experiences. I mean, when we got to upstate, there was nothing. I mean, nothing. They had a couple of developmental pediatricians and a handful of psychologists. Um, and they had the primary service for developmental disabilities was speech, OT, and facilitated communication. And um, that was what we were up against. And, you know, you're bringing in behavior analysis against that, where people who believe in voodoo, um, basically. And, um, and, you know, now we've got this program. We've got philanthropic support. We've got a rat lab. We've got, you know, a bunch of people working here, a master's program. And it's... Um, it's all because of those experiences that, you know, you don't really ever, I think, when I have a 30,000 foot view, it's like from a strategic plan perspective, not from a, the perspective of my history. And so I don't ever really think of, take time to sort of sit back and think, oh yeah, that was cool. Um, because honestly, I think in all those times I described, I was probably really freaking stressed out. So <laughs> yeah, it's completely it was cool. <laughs> completely understandable but I mean just from the types of experiences that you've had and now that you've that you have in upstate as well that I think the type of dissemination I think this is something that I really respect and kind of look up to because dissemination is probably one of my biggest in areas of interest and in, you know connecting to these other professionals like you said that might be following some voodoo or some, you know, the pseudoscience and all of that stuff and really not just, you know, throwing behavior analysis in their face, but really finding a way to partner with these individuals to start creating these programs and yeah. make them successful. Yeah. And you can, you know, you can, you can partner with them if they want to partner back. Right. And they don't. Always. Um, I, I have a, um, you know, my division now, we have a, um, a diagnostic clinic that has done the same diagnostic practice for basically 30 years. So literature be damned, we're going to continue doing what we're doing, right? And I had a psychologist who ran it for 30 years who um, was not interested in um, hearing about, you know, the virtues of doing an ADOS or, or whatever it was, right? Um, and she didn't want to, she didn't want to co collaborate. Right. Um, and so she retired and, um, and we're meeting to decide, um, now how we're going to revise that diagnostic practice. But sometimes you have to, um, you know, sometimes you can collaborate with people. Sometimes you have to, um, convince people why it's a good reason. Sometimes you have to work around people who don't want to collaborate to convince other people why it's a good reason. Um, one of the things that I've kind of made, uh, um, I haven't, I didn't know that I've kind of set out to do this and I haven't really even operationalized it that much yet. But one of the things that I've started to think a lot about is how can we introduce behavior analysis into mainstream pediatrics? And I think that one of the things that we do really well at our conferences and in our journals is tell each other how smart we all are. Um, we're really smart. 
Right. And I mean, like, you know, we're real good at saying, Hey man, I'm smart and you're smart. And you know, we're all smart, but I don't know that we get that message out to other providers that much and being in a, um, or other specialties and being in pediatrics, it gives me that, uh, um, um, you know, a little bit of a, an avenue to do that. And so we, me and, uh, Wayne and Jim Carr published a paper a few years ago. Um, just, I mean, it was nothing major, but it was just kind of a, what is applied behavior analysis? And like, what do, you know, pediatricians have probably heard this term, but what does it mean? What do they do? And we published it in, um, in the journal of pediatrics, which was, a uh, really, um, so if a behavior analyst read it, they'd be like, yeah, okay, great. But for a pediatrician to read it, that's kind of a cool thing. And um, other, I'm not the only one, you know, Pat Fryman has been doing stuff like this for years, a bunch of other people have too, but I was able to kind of, you know, from that, I think people read it and they asked me to be on their board. And so now there's a behavior analyst on the board of a pediatric journal, which is really neat. Um, and then um, somehow, somebody read it and asked me to edit a volume of this pediatric clinics of North America, which is a, um, a series that comes out for practitioners. And, you know, they wanted to do it on prevention or something like that. And I thought, well, this is a really good chance to talk about what's called tertiary or secondary or tertiary prevention. But from the perspective of what do behavior analysts do for things like gun safety um, and, uh, you know, or, or dental problems. And so you, um, you know, you have people like Ray Miltenberg or Keith Allen who are doing this really cool stuff and, um, and they disseminate it in behavioral journals, but, um, you know, you want to start disseminating it in pediatric journals too, or maybe psych journals or what have you. And so, um, I think that's a, a really important thing, um, from kind of a traditional dissemination perspective, I think. By the same token, what you're doing with this kind of podcast and you and your colleagues is equally important because that's, um, you know, it's a, it's a different stream of dissemination, but it's an um, equally valuable one because it's a very portable one and, and one that I think really helps to connect people with, with, uh, with you know, researchers and stuff. So I think there's a, a lot of really interesting um, um, opportunities for, for dissemination for behavior analysts. Yeah, and I completely agree. And I mean, even in the recent year or year and a half, there have even been a lot more articles posted out there about storytelling and how behavior analysts aren't always that great at relating to other fields. And so, you know, just the fact that you guys have you know, this background and you're in the field, they know who you are, but you also know the terminology because knowing the terminology and being familiar with these other fields is what's going to help bridge that is what I believe is going to somewhat help bridge that gap. Totally, yeah. Yeah. And so just, you know, getting out there and you not only, you know, starting up and being a major founder in all of these areas and all of these centers, but also that dissemination. That's one thing that I think is just something that we all should be striving more for is yeah. that dissemination and, you know, taking off what I like to call our, a lot of times um, some people in our field have blinders as to what behavior analysis is and what it can do. I don't know what you mean. I don't, you know, I know I'm just, I'm just a very opinionated person. And so I just throw it out there all the time. Um, but it's, that's my goal with this podcast is to show, you know, people in our field that there are ways to get out there and there are ways to do this. And is it, like you said, is it stressful? Yes. yes. <laughs> is it hard work? Yes, but it can be done. And a lot of the times behavior analysts are making these types of connections and they might not even realize it, that they're yeah. getting into these fields and they're working with these other professionals and that they're learning the lingo of these professionals that they can then start disseminating. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, imagine if like every behavior, not that I'm saying people shouldn't go to like the ABAI conference or whatever, but you know, imagine if everybody took a year off from that on a rotating schedule and they said, you know, this year I'm going to spend my travel funds. I'm going to go to the, um, you know, the 
pediatric academic society, you know, or I'm going to go to APA. Um, and, and they put as much effort into organizing symposia for that. Um, and, you know, I think that's, um, no, I mean, I, you know, I don't do that either. So I <laughs> um, kind of pot, call the kettle black, but I, I think it's, there's, there's ways to, to do that, but obviously, you know, for, for many people, there's, um, you know, there's other things built into the annual conference that, that you, you know, you go to other meetings and you, you work on with colleagues and, um, deadlines kind of revolved around that. But, um, there, there really is a lot. And, and I think it's fairly, um, fairly limitless, but it, it requires us to be, to, you know, soften, maybe change a little bit of the language that we use. I think it also, and, makes us realize that we have to sometimes talk in ways or about things that we're maybe not comfortable with to, sh to show almost like a um, relatability to people. Like I'm giving a talk tomorrow, not a talk, and like an interview for a news thing about um, people doing a sensory friendly um, haunted house for kids with autism, which I'm not sure exactly how you make a haunted house sensory friendly. <laughs> Um, but that's not anything that I wake up in the morning and think how, you know, what can we do to make, um, but you know what, it's going to be a, I, you know, I, there, I know some stuff about these sensory friendly interventions or attempts. And, um, I know enough about the diagnostic criteria of autism to be able to say some informative things, I hope. And, but that's something where I'm not going to say anything about behavior analysis. Um, but I'm going to end up talking about something that people can relate to. And they might say, well, who's this guy I heard, you know, on the, on the news tonight. And, um, and then they might look into that, you know, and I think that's a, it's not a matter of me saying, all right, well, I'm going to talk to the media about our newest, you know, relapse data. <laughs> they don't care about that, uh, you know, but it might be a way to sort of uh, bring people in and probably doesn't do any harm. Right. But, you know, people need to really um, kind of embrace some things like that too. And um, there's probably a whole host of other ways that I hadn't thought of. Yeah. And I mean, I have brought this up um, just to colleagues and stuff before, but one of the, probably one of the best learning experiences I had from my master's program was I, we were doing community consultation for a mental, a mental health, uh -huh. a community mental health agency. And my PhD mentor, um, Tom Rackhouse, one of the families wanted to try something and me being this gung-ho master's student, like first or second, I don't know which year it was, but I was like, no, we can't do that. That's not evidence-based. Like jumping right in and you know, this, not to the family, this was just during his and my, mm -hmm. our meeting, but he goes, Shauna, he goes, is this going to harm the client or, you know, stall progress on anything we want to do? I'm like, no, not technically. He goes, okay, well, why don't we work with the family building the rapport to try what they want to try and show and teach them how to take data and, you know, then we'll make a decision on if it's working or not. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. It's, and I think sometimes as behavior analysts, we might be a little quick to jump the gun on, oh, well, that's not what I learned in my master's program it's not evidence-based we can't do it but yeah. I think that you know sometimes we have to look at the bigger picture and how we're building these types of because I know that you know OTs come in a lot speech and language come in a lot with in school psychologists and just depending on which you know clinical application a lot of the BCBAs are in right now but mm -hmm. really trying to build the really trying to build that rapport with them and Kind of working within the system rather than trying to yeah. like, break through the system and make everybody do it our yeah. way. We we made that mistake in Atlanta and in Omaha. I think especially in Omaha, we went in and they had a pretty well established OT program, and you know we just went in and said like, all right, well that's all wrong, um, and you're you're not going to make friends that way, and and the and that situation um one of the major um kind of schools where a lot of kids and our you know with our sort of demographics 
um, were students was very OT based. And so then all of a sudden, you know, and you need the schools to work with you, right? You may not need them to admit patients, but you need them to work on generalization, teacher training. Um, and so all, you know, right off the bat, you get a reputation as being somebody who was difficult to work with. And, and how's that gonna work out to help the kid? And so coming here and to Syracuse, it was like, okay, we can't do that. Plus you got all these people doing facilitated communication. And so, you know, it's just a matter of time before some kid through facilitated communication says, you know, Hank's an asshole or whatever they, sorry, um, but whatever they say. You know? and, um, and that was a big challenge, you know, and I, I looked into the ethics of it because you're, you're, you're dead on, man, that there's this notion that you say, you inform parents that this is not an evidence-based treatment, which we have done. But I tell you what, man, we've had, I had this parent who, his kid did facilitated communication and through facilitated communication, they learned that the kid um, was able to speak Japanese and knew trigonometry. And no one asked the question of how he learned these things, right? So dad tells me that. And I say, you know, how do you learn those things? And, and you know, you don't want to, you know, it's tough because you never want to be like the jerk, right? But, you know, the dad said, he said, you know, every Friday night we put our kids to bed and we sit on the back patio or the back porch. We have a glass of wine and we read our son's facilitated communication transcripts from the week about how he loves his mom and about how he, you know, how he's sad that his behavior makes us unhappy. He think, man, that's all they got. That, that's all they've got. You know, their kid's nonverbal. And it's, it's, it's a tough compromise, you know, because you, you have to say, here's the, here's the extant literature. But if somebody wants to believe, you know, whether it's facilitated communications or UFOs, they're going to believe it. You know, I mean, they, you know, they got all kind of channels out there with TV shows about searching for ghosts and Bigfoot. So there's a market for stuff. And, um, and it's the, it's the same thing with that. And so you, you know, you obviously have to do your due diligence and, and stay true to your guidelines, but, um, but you know, there's a human side to it. And you, you um, like to the case you described, you have to show that you're willing to be a partner and you have to sometimes use those opportunities as a teaching moment. Um, uh, whether it's about data collection or, or what have you. Thank you for listening to Thought Leaders. Come back next month as we talk more with Dr. Henry Rohn about where he sees the field of behavior analysis going or where he would like to see the field go. And as always, if you have questions, feedback, or suggestions, please reach out to us at operantinnovations at abatechnologies.com.